Okay, let's take a look at something called Hooke's Law. This deals with forces when we're talking about springs. So let's say we've got a spring and we'll make this a vertical spring. And we've got it hanging from a ceiling or something like that. It's just hanging straight down. If we add a mass to it, there's mass M, the spring is going to stretch, okay? So it's going to come down here, some delta X. All right, and there's gonna be a force on that. Okay, we could also have a situation where we've got a spring, and let's say it's a spring where it likes to be compressed instead of stretched. So we got some kind of plate right here or something like that and we are going to produce a force in that direction and we are going to depress that spring some delta x. So we can do horizontal, vertical, alright, we can stretch the spring, we can compress it, alright, and we've got this delta x and it takes force to do that. Okay. Now it also turns out that the more I depress this thing the more force I need. It's actually not a constant force. Doesn't take much at first and then that force increases. Same here. If I pull down on this thing, initially it's pretty easy to stretch, but it gets harder and harder and harder as you apply more force. So we can look over here and let's say we're going to call this FS. Okay, this is the force um, for the spring. All right, and down here we are going to change how far. Okay, we are either stretching or compressing. So let's say we have, let's say we have kind of a medium weight spring. All right, as we stretch it, we're going to pull on it. The force to do that is going to go up. Okay. Now, if we have um, a spring that's a little bit lighter. All right, it's easier to stretch the same distance. Okay, then I would have a graph that looked something like this. Okay, I'm stretching it the same distance as this one, but it doesn't take as much force to get it to that point. All right, then I could have a really tough spring, like maybe a sh one like on a shock absorber or something like that. Okay, it might have a, the graph might have a slope like that. Okay, now the slope we call K, all right? K is also called the spring constant. All right, and you can see from the graph, if I have this K value, it's greater slope. All right, this would be like a stiff spring. Okay, and this would be like some kind of lightweight spring. So for example, if I take this spring here, okay, this spring's kind of loosey-goosey, all right? It's very easy to stretch. It might be down here. It's got a low spring constant, okay? This spring, it's a little tougher to stretch. It takes more force to stretch it the same distance. So it's got a higher spring constant, higher slope. It might be somewhere in here. All right, so spring constant K is very similar to mu. All right, if we have mu, that's, that's dealing with the surfaces in contact. K describes that spring specifically. All right, now if we take this, this, and this, and we put it all together, we can, we can, uh, we can do that by saying slope equals rise over run. All right, my slope is K, rise is FS, and run is delta X. It is the change in length of the spring, not the spring's length itself. Okay, so if I rearrange this for FS, I have S at FS is equal to K delta X. 
This right here is called Hooke's Law. All right, that's it. Now, your AP equations page does this to you. They say negative K delta X. Most time we will drop. Most times we'll drop that sign, okay? Here's what the sign means. Um, it tells us that, let's say the spring is stretched downward, okay, like this over here. The force is going to be upward, okay? The spring's force that the spring is producing is going to be opposite its stretch. That's what the negative sign means. But mostly we say, forget about that. We're just going to leave it positive, leave everything positive, and we know what all these mean in their directions. Okay, so you can kind of ignore that. Um, this can now be put on all our FBDs. So for example, for this situation right here, let's do an FBD for that. We hang a mass on there. It stretches. And um, we'll put a dot for the center of mass. The FBD would simply be mg. And if it is in equilibrium, static equilibrium, we can put fs right here. All right? And we can say F net equals zero. So we could solve for, say, the spring constant. If we wanted to do that, we'd say Mg is equal to Fs. And then we can say Mg is equal to K delta X. And this is easy to measure. That we have. That's very easy to measure. So anytime you need a spring constant, in a lab or something like that, all you have to do is hang a mass from it. And if you do that, you can get the spring constant. So I've got K is equal to mg over delta x. All right, and this could be in all sorts of FBDs. So you might have, for example, um, a ramp. And let's say at the bottom of the ramp, there was a spring and a mass that had just accelerated down the spring and it had depressed the spring some delta x. Let's say the spring started way up here and that mass has now compressed that spring. Okay, We could draw the FBD on this. So all sorts of situations that we can now apply this to. Um, this is a pretty complicated one and I haven't ever seen that on one of my tests or anything like that. But, you know, we could have a situation where we're on a horizontal and we could be stretching or compressing some spring. Let's say I wanted to do the FBD on this right here. Um, here's the center of mass. All right, and let's say this thing is compressed. We would have FS in this direction. We would have normal force in this direction. We would have mg here. Okay, and this could be frictionless or it could have friction. All right, so really what I'm trying to say is this is just another force we can include on our FBDs. All right, so a couple examples there. And what else? Um, last thing I'll say, how about units? K What's the unit for mg? Well, it's a force, so it's newtons. Delta x is meters. So spring constant, we don't reduce that to anything. This is the unit. Okay, so let's say we have um, a spring constant equal to 5n slash m. What does that mean? It means this. It will take five newtons of force to stretch or compress one meter. All right, so a shock absorber on a car, for example, is going to be thousands of newtons per meter. All right, some of them are going to be less than one if you had a super, super light spring. So this will show up in labs. It'll also show up probably in some multiple choice on your test. Um, 
maybe some free response. So just kind of adding on to the forces that we have available to calculate, we've now got Hooke's Law. Later we'll talk about energy stored in the spring and all of that. So thanks for watching and happy FBDing. Okay, bye.